Uh, hello, my name is Abraham Liddell. I am a postdoc in the Data Science Institute. Today, I would like to introduce Professor Matthew Salganik. He is a professor of sociology at the University of Princeton. He's also uh, affiliated with several of Princeton's interdisciplinary research centers, including the Center for Information Technology Policy, the Office of Population Research, and the Center for Statistics and Machine Learning. His research interests include computational social science and social networks. He is the author of Bit by Bit, the Social Research in the Digital Age. Uh, and during the 2022-2023 academic year, uh, he, is, he is on sabbatical in the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, his talk will be the unpredictability of life outcomes. Please give it up for Professor Salgani. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hi to everyone here. Hi to everyone on the live stream. Um, so what Abraham didn't mention is I graduated from Columbia uh, 15 years ago. I got my PhD here. And as I walked through campus today on the way to this talk, I noticed that some things have not changed very much. So low library still looks like low library. Uh, but some things have changed in the last 15 years. Um, one of them is the Data Science in Institute. Uh, I wish that had existed when I was a PhD student here. Um, but in addition to changes at Columbia, there's also lots of changes in the wider world. And so my own research tries to take advantage of these changes to help us do social science in new ways. So this is the book you heard briefly about, Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. This book is for social scientists that want to do more data science, data scientists that want to do more social science, and anyone interested in the hybrid of these fields. So I spend time in both of these communities. I'm trained as a sociologist. I work in a sociology department. I also like to hang out with people doing data science. And what I've come to realize is that these two communities have a lot to um, learn from each other and have a lot to give to each other. And so it's like you have two friends that you know would really hit it off well, but they don't know each other yet. And so you have a party to bring them together. And so you can think of bit by bit as like that party to bring these communities together. All right, but when people think about computational social science, often what they think about is new kinds of data. So we'll talk about uh, data from Twitter or data from cell phones or digital banking records, all of these kinds of new things of data. That is definitely something that's happening. But I also want to emphasize that computational social science can also be new ways of thinking, even about old data. So everything that I'm going to show you today is old data, uh, pre-digital age data. But computational social science can change the way we look at that data in a way that I think can be generative for how we do social science. So. This story that I'm gonna tell you today does not really have an ending yet because it's something I'm still very actively working on. Um, uh, but this is probably a good place to begin the story. Um, so this is a paper that I published with my 111 closest co-authors. And uh, this was a scientific mass collaboration. And we were trying to answer uh, a pretty basic question. So how predictable are life outcomes? So given a bunch of data about a kid or a, a, a person um, over time, how well can we predict what will happen to them in the future? So it seems like a pretty basic question. Um, this question also seems very surprising and strange to many people. So to many data scientists, this is a strange question because they assume that this is something that social scientists have been studying for forever. And we must know the answer to this question because this is like the first question a data scientist might ask. To social scientists, this question is strange because we never ask questions about predictability generally. Uh, and predictability is not something we, we think about much. So it's kind of a strange question to both of these communities, but it is a very natural question to everyone else in the world. Um, and so this the strangeness of this question illustrates some of the kind of two different cultures that exist within social science and data science. So I like to summarize these with this idea of the Y hat culture and the beta hat culture. So if you think of a linear regression, it's Y hats as a function of some beta hats and some data. 
in sociology. So if you went to a talk in the Columbia sociology department when I was a graduate student, it would follow like a pretty standard recipe. If it was a quantitative talk, there would be some, some motivation, some theory, some data, and then a table of regression coefficients and a test of whether those regression coefficients were different than zero. And I see people nodding. So I guess this is still a pretty standard recipe. Um, so that's the world that I'm used to. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I had the pleasure of doing a sabbatical at Microsoft Research in New York. And they have a seminar there and I went to the seminar and there was theory, there was data, there was results and there was no beta hats. The results are all about Y hats. How well can we predict a certain thing from some data? And so that kind of, to me, really clearly illustrates these two cultures, but at the same time, each of these cultures is incomplete. So to focus only on one of these things with, and completely ignore the other is missing a lot of the story. Really the world, the regression model is both of these things. And so increasingly we are seeing uh, this kind of interpretable machine learning techniques. These to me look a lot like bringing the beta hat world that I know into the Y hat world. And I think increasingly we will also see social scientists bringing prediction into social science it to lead to the goal of more understanding. So why hat in the service of beta hat? And so again, I wanna really emphasize that social scientists should care about predictability, even though we traditionally have not. Um, and I think there's two important reasons. The first is scientific. So how well I can predict what will happen to a kid based on, let's say, the information about them that I can collect at their birth. That is a basic social fact that varies across space and time. And so as a sociologist that studies intergenerational processes, that's something that I want to understand. Second is um, prediction can often be very good as a way of forcing you to discover new things. So forcing you to improve your data, your methods, and your theory. So what I hope to show is that sometimes prediction can force us to confront what we really, how much we don't understand. Uh, I hope I'll illustrate that talk. And we have a question. Yeah, so let me just say, uh, uh, we'll do questions um, of clarification as we go. And then the longer questions we'll hold to the end. So feel free to ask and I might push it to the end. Sure, let's do it. Oh. About predictability of social science. Yes. Yeah. At least my view of, so we can wait to the end to talk about it. But yeah. My view from sociology or you know, the angle I come from is there's a tacit norm that if something is not very predictable, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, the work is not worth publishing. Mm -hmm. You know, so this idea to understand at a meta level, like the predictability of something and accepting that it might be very predictable or the error term might be pretty large, and there might be a lot of randomness there. Um, there's norms in some fields where like, that also has a good and a bad associated with those outcomes, even though that has nothing to do necessarily with the real data or the analysis. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. Sure, so uh, we will come back to this at the end, but I would say it is true that um, the measure of predictability is often thought of as a measure of success of the research, and I don't think that's appropriate. However, if the model is not very predictive and you don't have a good explanation for why it is not very predictive, then I would think that raises some concerns about your knowledge of, of your, how much you've learned about the system you're studying. Okay, so uh, we should care about predictability for scientific reasons and we should also care about predictability for policy reasons. So this is an article from the New York Times Magazine about what's happening now in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is uh, basically Pittsburgh. And they use an algorithm to create risk scores about uh, children in, for, in, for at risk of uh, uh, harm. So if someone calls a Child Protective Services hotline, they can report if they think there's a kid in danger. Uh, in, the, in the past, these decisions about whether to investigate the case or not were made by the person who answered the phone. Um, and it's very clear that making a wrong decision has consequences. So if you investigate a case where there is no child abuse, 
or child neglect, that is itself harmful because these investigations can be very disruptive. On the other hand, obviously, if there is a child at risk and you do not investigate, that is also a serious mistake. So you want to make these decisions the best way you can. And the government there has decided that they want to build an algorithmic risk score based on all of the administrative data that they have um, and prior judicial decisions about abuse and neglect. And so then when the person answers the phone with a tip or a report, they see the risk score and then they hear the interview the person and then they make their decision. So this is one specific example, but this general process is becoming increasingly common and will become even more common in the future. So this is both very potentially exciting and hopeful, but also potentially scary. Uh, what, one second. So, so on the one hand, people say, hey, the Child Protective Services System is not doing as well as we would like it to do. So let's try to use data to help make it better. That seems promising. Um, we know that these algorithms, particularly algorithms trained with biased historical data can reproduce those patterns. And so that seems like problematic. And, and I myself have a little bit of both of those views. But what I wanna say is that this entire debate, very active, very important debate, misses a more basic fundamental question, which is how accurate are these predictions at all? So if you are a policymaker and these models work perfectly or nearly perfectly, that would lead to one set of policy considerations. If these models don't really work at all, that would lead to a very different set of policy considerations. So I think as researchers, we have not given policymakers the basic research that they need to help weigh these difficult decisions. So this is another reason why I think we have to have a better scientific understanding of what kinds of things are predictable with what kinds of data using what kinds of methods. Any questions? You had said, but the person ultimately is still making the decision here? Yes, in this particular case, the person is still making the decision. Uh, in other cases, uh, usually not in these high stakes settings, but in other cases, certainly there are people that fully automated process. Um, so I've chosen to start to study the predictability of life outcomes in this amazing data set called the Fragile Family and Child Wellbeing Study. It's jointly hosted at Princeton and Columbia. So um, it was a longitudinal cohort study of about 5,000 children who were born in 20 US cities around the year 2000. And there was an oversample of non-marital births. And then these children have been, these families have been followed over time uh, from when the kid was born to when the kid is 15. Now data from uh, when the kids are 22 years old is being collected. Uh, this data is an amazing resource. It's been used in hundreds of papers and dozens of dissertations. And I want to specifically acknowledge the original PIs, Sarah, Irv, and Ron, and then the current PIs, uh, Kathy and Jane. Uh, Jane is a member of the faculty here, or uh, is a member of the faculty here as well. Um, and, and in addition to, to these people listed up here, there is like a tremendous team and community behind the study. It's really, really wonderful. So this is uh, one way to look at the data uh, that they've collected. So this shows you the different ages uh, that the kids were when the data was collected. And then that's each column and each row is a module of data collection. So for example, this dot here represents a survey that the researchers did with the mother when the child was born. And so what you can see is as the child ages, they collect more and more data, including not just about the mother and the father anymore, but they do an in-home assessment. They interview the child themselves. There's also a survey of the teacher. And so let me just show you a little bit more detail what each one of these dots represents. So this is the survey that was given to the mother when the child was born. And it included a bunch of different modules about child health and development, mother-father relationships, fatherhood, marriage attitudes, relationships and extended kin, environmental factors and government programs, health and health behavior, demographic characteristics, education, and employment, income. I'm reading that out not so you remember exactly what's included, but to emphasize, this is a very thorough survey that tried to collect things that people who spent their life studying 
families thought was important to understand the lives of these families. So this is what was collected when, at the, from the mother at birth. And these are all of the different modules that were collected from birth to age nine. So it's an incredible amount of data. And I'm not saying that this study is perfect. I'm definitely, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But I would say this study represents best practices in longitudinal surveys as done by social scientists today with the budgets that we have. Okay. So this is the data structure. And when I got involved, um, the data from birth to year nine had been collected and was publicly available. People were using it to, for research. The data from age 15 was collected, but it was not yet publicly available. So at age 15, the kids, uh, the age 15 data was being cleaned and prepared for, for release. And this moment is a magical moment. This is a very, very special opportunity that exists inside of every single longitudinal study and is, as far as I know, never really taken advantage of. Um, because if you have data that's collected but not yet available, that allows you to do a project using the common task method. And so here now we bring in some ideas from data science. So the common task method involves basically like a prediction challenge. So maybe you've heard of the Netflix prize or you've heard of Kaggle something like that. And so the way it works is we all agree to, all the researchers agree to do the same thing. We try to use the same data set to predict the same outcome with the same error metrics. And then we can see who's predicting it better and we can see how they did and we can see how a range of techniques work. So the idea that lots of scientists work together on a problem is not new, of course. Uh, but usually we all work with different data sets. We have different goals. It becomes very hard to learn very much from each other. So we have meta-analysis, obviously. But anyone who's tried to do meta-analysis knows how hard it is to try to make all these things reconcilable. So the common task method, which is very common in machine learning, solves that problem. It also solves a second important problem, which is it produces very credible estimates of predictability. So just like a randomized control trial is a way of producing credible causal estimates, the common task method is a way of producing credible estimates of predictability. And so let me explain how it does that. So what we did is we took all the data that had been collected between birth and age nine. And if you stitch that all together, it comes out to about 13,000 variables for about 4,000 families. And then we picked six outcome variables, and these were selected in consultation with Sarah and other domain experts who spend their lives studying these families. And so one of these outcome variables was the GPA of the kids in school, the grades of the kids in school. And so people applied to participate in the Fragile Families Challenge. They were given all this background data, and then they were given the grades of half the kids. And then we said, use any technique you want to predict the grades for the other kids. And those other grades were kept secret. They didn't have access to them. So there's two gray sets here, the leaderboard set and the holdout set. The leaderboard set was something that was available during the challenge. And we're not gonna talk about that anymore. We're gonna focus on the holdout set. So this is data that no researchers had access to that they're trying to predict. And so you could use any kind of data science technique you want. You could use any kind of social science technique you want. You could use any kind of any kind of technique. You wanna go walk in the woods and just meditate about it. That's fine too. Um, and then what we do is everyone will upload their predictions and then we open them up and compare and calculate the mean squared error. And so again, I said, this produces very credible estimates of predictability if many people try to do this um, because if the estimates are higher than you expect, you cannot explain them away based on overfitting or researcher degrees of freedom. So many social scientists are familiar with this idea of p-hacking. And so in a predictive modeling sense, there are equivalent p-hacking like things. Here, that stuff is not possible because the entire thing is pre-specified and run by a third party. Um, also, you, if the predictions are less, accurate than you expect, you can't explain that away based on the failure of any individual researcher. So if I were to do this and not be able to predict the grades, you might say, oh, Matt, that's because you didn't use deep learning. Or, oh, Matt, that's because you haven't read Bourdieu or whatever. There's many reasons why I might fail at this. 
Um, but if hundreds of researchers using a wide range of techniques with a wide range of backgrounds all are unable to do this, that is a sign that it is fundamentally difficult. Yes, question. Um, the data being not predictable and the data set being not large. That's a great question. Um, and I will come back to that later, but the answer is we don't really know. Uh, yes? More about predictability. Um, how do you know even the same exact data? Is it, is it basically predictability as much on time? Like 10 years from now, they're using maybe different methods, maybe in the same data, you could predict it to a much higher degree? Yeah, so we cannot rule out the fact that some new method will be created 10 years from now that will allow people to make this prediction uh, better. I actually don't think that's possible. And for reasons that I will show you later. Yep. I was, so just so I understand the conceptual idea of unpredictability. Yep. Is that the error from the mean estimate from these, the actual grades that you collect from these students, for instance, for that outcome for, for these 15 year old kids? Or is it the variance of the estimates and wider variance means more unpredictable? Obviously, those two things are related, but. Sure. Um, I saw there was something in the chat about repeating the question. So the question is, what do we mean by unpredictable? And in fact, that leads to the next slide. Um, thank you. So we are going to measure unpredictability using this metric R squared and the holdout data. And so basically what this is, is in the numerator, we compare each prediction to the truth and square it. And we add that up over all of the holdout data. And then what we do is we compare that to the, predict the accuracy you would get from a null model. So in this case, we compare it to what you would get if you predicted the mean of the training data. So uh, this is like the average GPA in the training data is about 2.87. And so if we just predict 2.87 for everyone. And so with this, and then we take one minus that ratio. So with this measure of R squared, um, there are two important kind of benchmarks for you to keep in mind. One is an R squared of zero means you're not doing any better than predicting the mean of the training data. So basically nothing, all that data is not doing anything. Uh, R squared of one means the predictions are perfect. Okay, so those are two things to keep in mind, this question. I just, so conceivably you could get the same R squared for people who no one predicts the right and everyone's like, there's a bunch of people who are over predicting, a bunch of people are under predicting, but it averages out to be right versus like, there's a lot of error, but it's all relatively tightly clustered or all right above or right below. So I'm just trying to understand how you distinguish between those types of outcomes. Sure, so R squared is one summary. So there's 1591 cases in the holdout set. So we have 1591 errors. R squared is one particular summary of those errors. The reason we picked it is because the outcome that the people were optimizing in the challenge was mean squared error. And so we wanted to have a result that we present to people that was a direct transformation of mean squared error not something that, because you know there are many, many, many different metrics of predictability. Uh, but if we used a metric that was not related to what people were optimizing in the challenge, it might not be as easy to interpret. In the paper, we also have some scatter plots of these. I have some at the end, which I can show if there's time. Uh, but let me show you first as a top line summary, like what is this number? But before I do, I want to ask you all to vote. Okay. So, cause I'm curious what you think. So let's take predicting grades. So you saw how much information there was from birth to year nine. You saw all, the, all of those modules um, <clears throat> and predicting the grades at age 15. So how many people think the R squared will be greater? And, and we're talking, we had 160 teams participate from all over the world, mix of social science and data science. What do you think is the best of these 160 teams for predicting grades, what's the best R squared? So if you've read the paper, please don't, don't vote. But if you haven't read the paper, I would love to hear your guesses. So what we're gonna do is how many people think the R squared will be greater than zero? Okay, good. So now keep your hands up. 
How many people think the R squared will be greater than 0.1 or 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1. So we see a range. Like 0.4 seems to be at the mean. We have one up to 0.8. Are you a data scientist? Yes. So one thing I so there's a couple of reasons why I um, like to do this. Uh, one is it just breaks up the talk a little bit. Um, another is that I get to learn a lot from the different audiences where I've done this, and I see there's again two very different communities. Data scientists often think the predictability will be much much higher than social scientists do. The final reason to do this, I think, is to show you how hard it is. So you all, I saw some very concerned looking faces as you were trying to do this. And I think that should show you that like, we don't really know how to answer this pretty basic question. And there's huge variation, even in this room full of experts, right? Like, so now I'm gonna show you the results. So these are the R squareds for the six different outcomes that we looked at. So for material, GPA was 0.19. Um, so let me just, so the six outcomes were material hardship, which is a measure of the experience, poverty of the family. GPA, grit is a psychological measure. Eviction is whether the family was evicted from their home. Job training is whether the parent went, underwent job training. And layoff is whether the parent was laid off. So you see material hardship and GPA are about 0.2 the others are close to zero. So this is one way to look at the result. And this is, I think, the better way to look at the result. So everything that the Fragile Families team thought about and measured incredibly carefully over this huge time span is in blue. And the dominant pattern here is this vast white space. So I've seen this plot many times and, and I am always amazed by it. Yeah. Ah, great. Grit is a psychological measure of passion and perseverance and it's measured on a scale with four questions. So for example, when I, when I run into something difficult, I'm able to persevere through that. So, uh, all of these things are measured in surveys, self-reported surveys. So we, we could talk more about what that might mean and how that might lead to some unpredictability in a second. So what is going on here? What, how do we make sense of this plot? And I think we don't, I, I think we don't really have the intellectual infrastructure to answer this because we haven't thought about predictability enough as social scientists. So. Let me, to help you see the, the, the white space in our thinking, the gaps in our knowledge, I want to compare how we think about causal inference to how we think about predictability. Yep. Sorry. Um, just back to that, but those were the average R squared to the maximum? Max. Out of 160 teams. So... Again, I wanna compare causal inference to predictability for a second. So with causal inference, we have very clear conceptual frameworks, potential outcomes model, mostly associated with Rubin, DAGs, uh, mostly associated with Perl. We have very clear estimands, like direct and indirect effects, comply average causal effects. Each of these kinds of effects means something different. Uh, and then we have a variety of estimation techniques about which we have strong theoretical results and practical experience. So if we have causal inference questions, we have a variety of tools that we can draw from. If we have questions about prediction, I would argue we have very little to draw from. So I would say we have no conceptual frameworks. We have no clear estimates. The things that we have are these estimation techniques that we borrow from machine learning, cross-validation, supervised learning, common task method. These are all great things, wonderful. These were all developed for very different purposes in very different data environment. And so I don't think we've even done enough work to port these into the social sciences in a useful way. 
And I think more critically, we lack some of these more abstract ideas that will help us ask and answer the right question. So what is under these question marks? Like, this is what I would like to know. What is the potential outcomes model for questions about prediction? So how are we gonna try to answer that? So um, I think one of the big challenges with doing this next work is we don't have good theories and we don't have enough facts. So we have like this chicken and egg problem. So if you wanna get facts, like you wanna go and measure things, like that's great, but like you need theories to help you figure out what's the right thing to measure. Okay, so let's get the theories. Oh, we don't have any theories. We need some facts to make the theories. And so you have this kind of chicken and egg problem. And so what I'm doing now, I'm gonna tell you about two projects, um, one that's much more focused on facts and one that's much more focused on theories. And I'm gonna go relatively quickly sketch these out uh, because I do wanna leave some time for questions. So first, the study about facts. Um, so in this study, what we wanted to do is if, if you want to say, if you want to study predictability, you need to really measure the predictability of lots of things. So if I showed you the six outcomes for the fragile families challenge, you could make up a theory. We have about 20 people in this room. We could get 20 different theories that fit those six data points perfectly. Um, I'm sure the creativity in this room could achieve that. So we need to really measure the predictability of lots of things if we wanna like study the patterns in predictability. So we, the, fragile, the fragile families challenge was an immense, enormous undertaking and we can't do that a hundred times. It's just not, not possible. Um, and so we need like a high throughput way of getting these. And this is one of the things we're working on. And so we call our approach the million monkeys. Um, and this is loosely inspired by that uh, expression that if you have a million monkeys at a keyboard, one of them will produce the works of Shakespeare. Um, and so we have like a million uh, machine learning pipelines, hoping to find the Shakespeare of machine learning pipelines. Um, and so more specifically, what we did is we built on the work that happened during the Fragile Families Challenge. So during the challenge, we required participants to open source their code. And so we have a ton of information about how real social scientists and data scientists try to make predictions in this domain. And then we can find the techniques that were commonly used and re-implement them into some modular pipelines and then run all of them. So you can think of it as like, we can simulate a challenge, a mass collaboration, and then we can do that and we can predict, let's say all the outcomes at age 15. So this is a quick wire diagram of some of the data infrastructure. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. I just wanna say one thing. This required a huge amount of engineering, software engineering to do reliably, much more than we had expected. And it was very hard. Um, I think this would have been more or less impossible 10 years ago. Um, it is very hard today, but I'm very confident it will be much easier 10 years from now. Um, so just some preliminary findings. This is obviously work that's still ongoing. But uh, the results, the actual results will change, I'm sure, but I think this pattern will likely stay the same. So this is the distribution of R squared values for all of the outcomes at age 15. Um, and so zero is here. That's um, no prediction better than the mean of the training data. One is all the way over here. This is a histogram of values. So what this shows is that if you pick a randomly chosen outcome from the fragile families data set, the median R squared will be about 0.03. Yeah. Can you give us an example? Sure. So it'd be all of those things that you saw, it, like similar to the things that you saw was asked about the mother at birth. So um, education, uh, family relationships, things like this. So it's outcomes that, that it's really what it's measuring is our ability to predict the survey question, the, the kinds of survey questions researchers ask participants. So this is an important thing that I want to highlight is what is that? Like if, if we want to measure the predictability of important social outcomes, how do we make a list of what are the social outcomes we should try to predict? 
how do we say what is a sample of social outcomes that is reasonable? So if I want to say what's a random sample of people in New York, that is a well-specified thing. If I want to say what's a random sample of social outcomes, that is not a well-specified thing. So really, this is very much driven by the data that we have available, trying to predict all of the, that data. Ones on the right-hand side are basically ones that just tend to correlate really highly to the survey. Yeah, from birth to year nine. So for example, the ones far to the right are height and weight. So among the most predictable things social scientists measure is height and weight. Now, we don't measure it like, how many arms do you have, right? That would probably be even more predictable, but it's not measured. But height and weight is among the most predictable things that we do measure. Yes? Is each point here a method and an outcome, or is it the max, out, the max method for each? It's the max method. Uh, it's the max, the best pipeline for each outcome. Okay, so there's two ways to look at this. One would be, this is like a robustness track for the fragile families challenge. Like did the six outcomes we pick, were they particularly unusual? And this suggests, no, they're pretty typical for this data set. Um, I think a better way to think about this, the more exciting way to think about it is we can now try to see which kinds of variables are more or less predictive. So some of these variables are about health, some are about education, some are about the kid, some are about the parent. And so what we're working on now is trying to build a model to predict predictability. So given some information about an outcome, can we guess how predictable it will be? So I want to emphasize taking a step back now, what exactly were we trying to estimate and what did we estimate and how different those two things are? So the theoretical estimate that we care about here, I would say is the predictability of life outcomes, given different kinds of data and methods. That's what we care about. What we actually did is the predictability of life outcomes in wave six of the fragile family study using waves one to five and common machine learning methods. So if you think there's a big gap between the theoretical estimate and the empirical estimate, I agree with you. That is exactly why I'm writing this down because I, I was very influenced by this paper at the bottom here by uh, Lundberg, Johnson and Stewart about the importance of writing down what you are actually trying to do. And clarifying when they are not the same as what you've actually done, but that also highlights what we can do next. So every one of these things in blue is a modifiable parameter, right? So you can plug in any other longitudinal data set that you want. Just to emphasize, there are dozens of these in pretty much every OECD country has multiple studies like the fragile family study, not exactly like it, but you know, roughly like it. Um, and so what we can do is by doing lots of these things, build up some more of our basis of facts. And so this Million Monkeys research design, we think is really useful for these high throughput studies of predictability. So the mass collaborations like the Fragile Families Challenge, they are very high credibility, but they're low scalability. It's extremely time consuming. A, you could call a single monkey design where like I would try to do it myself. I think that would be very low credibility, very high scalability. And we hope the Million Monkeys design is a good intermediate where we get decent amount of credibility and decent amount of scalability. And ideally we'll move back and forth between all three of these types of designs to kind of build up a bigger picture of this very complex space. So that's a little bit about some of the facts we're trying to create. And now I wanna talk briefly about some of the theories we're trying to build and then we'll wrap up. So this work, um, is about tr trying to understand why the outcomes were so unpredictable. So we kind of initially thought, okay, the fragile families team, they measured all this stuff, but there's clearly other stuff out there impacting these kids. So we kind of call this stuff dark matter, which is like the idea that astronomers have that there's all this stuff out there in the universe that's big and important, but we can't, we don't even know what it is. And so we said, let's go and try to find, let's find the dark matter. And so we talked to some, we thought about it and we asked some machine learning people like, do you have any techniques for finding important and unmeasured variables in your data set? And they said, no, we don't have any techniques for that. And I said, well, guess sociologists have a technique for that. It's called talking to people. 
Um, and so what we did is we went and did some in-depth semi-structured interviews to try to find the dark matter. So this is a picture of dark matter, uh, which I think is funny because I don't know, they don't even know what it is, but they have a picture of it. So if you go to the Wikipedia page on dark matter, this is what you'll see. And so the idea though, if you wanna, let's think about how we normally do in-depth interviews. So normally we would take maybe an ad hoc sample of people, or if we're being very careful, we might take a random sample of people, simple random sample. But if you wanna find the dark matter, a simple random sample is not the best sample, right? So what we did is we used the predictions to help us find the people that we thought would have the most dark matter. So we interviewed some kids who are doing much, much better than expected. And we wanted to see what was allowing them to beat the odds. We did, interviewed some kids who were doing much, much worse than expected. We wanted to see what was causing them to struggle. And we interviewed some kids who were doing as expected as like a control condition. So we did these um, in-depth semi-structured interviews with the young adult and the primary caregiver. And we did the interviews separately. I will say this for me is the first time I've ever done in-depth interviews. So I learned a lot from working with my collaborators. One of the things I learned is I, this sounds so obvious. I said, why are we interviewing the young adult and the primary caregiver separately? That's like two, that's like burning our, our time, our sample size. It'd be better if we interviewed just one person from each family so we can interview twice as many families. And my collaborator is like, no, I think you're gonna hear different things from the kids and the parents. And they were totally right. So doing the interview separately was very good, yeah. choosing ones based off of like the error terms that are very far from the current classification techniques to try to optimize it feels very yeah so i i did semi-supervised learning i think is a big category but the way you described it the way you described it of yes we're going to use the errors to try to figure out what data to collect but we're not just creating new labels we already have the labels we're trying to really create new features or figure out what are the missing features um we interviewed about 40 families spread over about three cities. Um, we had two interviewers. Um, one of the interviewers was blinded to the outcome. So we had a long discussion about whether we wanted the interviewer to know whether a particular kid was beating the odds or struggling unexpectedly or not. And so the argument for knowing is that this can help you probe when you're doing the life course interview to figure out how, why they might be beating the odds. The argument for not knowing is you might be probing it, <laughs> like um, finding some noise. And so we settled on this design that has two interviewers, one of whom is blind, who goes through the interview guide, pretty much uh, following the script, then turns to the other interviewer who is unblind and say, oh, do you have any other questions or anything you think I missed? And so we have a pretty clear separation between the, the blinded interview, which is most of it, and the unblinded interview, which allows for the follow-up. So we did all these interviews and let me tell you what we found. Well, first, let me tell you what we did not find. So we did not find one single missing variable that explains everything. This should be obvious. Uh, in, in retrospect, it's very obvious as someone said to me, Matt, they collected 13,000 variables. What makes you think you will find the 13,000 and first variable? Um, but that doesn't mean we didn't learn anything from doing this. So we read and discussed all these transcripts and we inductively developed a conceptual framework. And so I wanna be clear, this is completely inductive. This is not pre-registered or anything like that. Um, and this inductive framework is one that is in the beginning of pretty much every machine learning textbook uh, that I've seen many times, but never thought of in this way. So you can do a mathematical decomposition of prediction error into two components. One component comes from irreducible error and one component comes from learning error. And so I'm gonna just try to illustrate these for you. So with social scientists, I think one way to think about this is uh, within group variability and between group variability. So let's imagine we're trying to predict GPA for some subpopulation of people. So the, the height of each dot is the GPA of the kid. Um, this is subpopulation defined by some predictors X. So this could be like girls whose mother went to college and father graduated from high school or something like that. 
And so we see within that subgroup, there's variability in GPA. So the best possible prediction we can make for the subgroup is the mean of the subgroup. That is the one that will minimize the squared error. So it is not possible to do better than predicting the mean of this subgroup for these people. So there will always be irreducible error, or you can think of it as within group variance. Also, we have, in reality, we don't have the whole population. We often have a sample. And so this, the subgroup, the sample subgroup mean is often different than the true subgroup mean. This is learning error. So these are the two different sources. If we think about this in a kind of more of a regression context, we take a sample, we fit a line, the, the model predicts that what the model is predicting is different than the true subgroup mean. So the one way to think about this is the irreducible error measures the within group variability. You can never do, get rid of that. It's, it's just there. The second term is the learning error that measures how well your machine learning model is predicting the true subgroup mean. This part you potentially can improve as you have better and better machine learning. But as the, those of you who know about machine learning know that this learning error is itself subject to the bias variance trade off and never goes to zero. So this is not something that is just gonna go to zero. Um, this is part of why I think there's no magical method that's gonna find this because you have to predict the subgroup means for millions and millions of subgroups with the, with the kind of data we have, it's just not possible. So the manuscript shows some social and measurement processes that lead to irreducible and learning error. So we had a question before about how we measure grit. And so if you imagine that the same person, if you measure their grit multiple times, you get a different measure that has the potential to create irreducible error if that measurement error is random. So we have other examples of things that we observe in these transcripts, some of which are about measurement, some of which are about things that are happening in the world. And I wanna emphasize here, there's really a fundamental tension between the irreducible error and the learning error. So if you say, you know what? I wanna predict things perfectly. I'm gonna start adding in more and more Xs to, to get the subgroups to be more and more uh, homogeneous, reduce the within group variability. As you add more and more Xs, the learning error gets bigger and bigger, right? So the thing you would try to do, it's like, it's like you squeeze one part of the balloon and the other part gets bigger. It, it, so, and that there is no way out of that. Um, so I think this decomposition is also really helpful for thinking about where the limits might come from for different kinds of data. So <clears throat> imagine if you have data that is short and thin. So this is like a relatively small number of cases, like hundreds of cases, 10 different features. This is like the data that I had exposure to in graduate school. So here there's gonna be substantial um, irreducible error because you're missing a lot of X's that are important. And there's gonna be a lot of learning error because you don't have that many cases to learn the subgroup means. Then we could move to a case like the fragile families where you have short data that's very wide. You have tons of predictors. Here, the barrier to prediction is gonna come from our inability to learn the right relationship. In this high dimensional setting, we don't really have enough cases. Alternatively, you can have a situation that's tall and thin. This is often like what you might see with administrative data from, from a government. You have lots of people, you don't have a lot of information about them. This case then, I think that the major source of error will come from the irreducible error, the missing predictors. And then what happens if we have tall and wide data, or if I was gonna come back 15 years from now, maybe tall and wide, um, where will the limits prediction come from in that setting? I don't know. I have some ideas about how we might be able to find out, but my guess is that it will probably come from the learning error. So we could talk more about that, but this is, I think, a big open question that we can now, people have been trying to do prediction for thousands of years. Like human, this is not something new to try to know what's gonna happen next, um, but we haven't had the data to really press the fundamental limits of what is possible. So that's a little bit about how we're trying to create facts and theories to go together. So the next is this year, as you heard, I'm on sabbatical, I'm working on a book uh, tentatively titled Predicting the Future, what we can do, what we can't do, and how we can tell the difference. Um, so any questions, comments, suggestions, things I should read, that would be incredibly helpful as I 
try to learn more about this new space. Um, what, what do I hope this will do? This, this is a, a graph of the hype cycle. This comes from a company called Gartner. They use it to understand new technologies. So again, as I said, with prediction, people have been trying to do that for a long time. But now we have big data, we have machine learning and AI. People are particularly excited about our ability to predict the future. And so I think what we will go, what we are going to go through is this hype cycle. So initially we will have this peak of inflated expectations where, oh, wow, this is gonna prevent 100% of child neglect in all of Allegheny County. And then we move into this trough of despair, like, oh, these algorithms are, are biased. And then hopefully, eventually, we get to this plateau of productivity where this becomes a useful tool that we can that we can take advantage of understanding the risks and benefits. So one goal to think about for this book is pushing down the peak of inflated expectations, pulling up the trough of despair, and getting to the plateau of productivity as quickly as possible. What will this plateau of productivity look like? I think we'll have to answer these two questions. Uh, what we can do and what we should do. And I think these two things are very related to each other. Um, so kind of one sense of what I'm thinking about what we can do. I'm very interested in doing things like the Fragile Families Challenge, which measure predictability in different ways. Also, that is a paper by Lorenz about um, chaos in the atmosphere. This is about a theoretical model that leads us to have a fundamental limit to our ability to predict the weather. If I told you I could predict the weather, three months from now, you would say, no, that's not true. And that's correct, it's not true. Like that, and this tells us why. So we have a model that tells us where the limit comes from. Also what we should do. So I think there's two main parts to that. So the top is a book by one of your colleagues, uh, Bernard Hardcourt, who argues that we should not use prediction at all in criminal justice settings. It's a very interesting argument specific to criminal justice. Um, so I think there's like some normative work about when we should or shouldn't try to do this at all. Like, <clears throat> I think many people in this room would say we should not put someone in prison for a crime that they might commit in the future, even if an AI model thinks they're going to predict it, right? That just seems wrong. Uh, so Harcourt argues there's actually a lot, that, that intuition actually applies much more broadly than we realize. So it's a really good book. And then there's a whole separate set of things about how we, if we are going to use these things, how we use them responsibly. So this is the machine bias is the article from ProPublica that documented the uh, racial bias in the compass uh, um, system that's used in criminal justice. So I think there's, you know, in terms of what we should do, there's some philosophical questions and also some very practical questions about how we audit and oversee these technologies. So, um, Thank you, and we have some time for questions. Before we, um, if you can look at your the closest mic to you and just turn it on when you ask a question, that way the people in the virtual audience can hear you. So just ask it into the mic, okay? We did have a couple online questions. Mm -hmm. Just want to get Sure, we'll do the online first since they haven't had a chance to ask yet, and then we'll come back. Yep. So it says, can we classify social outcomes, ergo self-reported, measured with a ruler or scale, et, et cetera? Do these classes differ in predictability? Can we conclude something about the classes of social outcomes? That's a great question. And that's like very similar to what we're working on now. So um, in the fragile families data, we have some things that are measured in self-reported surveys. We have some things that are measured with like a ruler and a scale. And so we can compare, but then one challenge that we will run into is that how it's measured is not the only thing that varies between these things. So like height and weight are, are much more physiological things. So we can measure, the things we can measure with rulers and scales are different than the things that we measure with self-reported data. So I think it will be very hard to disentangle whether it's the construct or the measurement technique, uh, but we have some, we're very interested in that question, trying to figure that out. And the, the next question in the chat is, are there potential misuses to predictability, i.e. either it's abuse in policy, either quote, you can't change it anyway, or the reinforcement of individual action versus systemic disadvantage, or it's substitution for more nuanced and less causal empirical social sciences? 
Sure. So there's absolutely ways that I think prediction can be misused. Um, and this is why I think it's very important actually for people who have these normative concerns to be involved in doing the research about prediction. Because I think it's hard to argue about how prediction can be used in the abstract because we can all think of, it's, a, it's like a dual use technology. Like you can use a hammer to build a house or to break a house. Like a hammer is a dual use technology. Prediction is a dual use technology. We can come up with examples or be used well. We can come up with examples that we would not be happy with. And so I think one question is, scientifically, can we build up an understanding of this? And then the second is, when we do deploy these things, how do we do it responsibly? And this is, uh, I think, a big, important, open question. It's something I've done a little bit of work on, many other people are working on. Um, but I just want to emphasize that prediction itself doesn't mean that we would necessarily like ignore the people or, or leave behind the people who are predicted to have problems. Like you could imagine prediction being used in a context where we try to give more resources to the people who are predicted to struggle. I mean, you may not think that is the likely way it will be rolled out. Um, that's a separate question. Um, but so I think it's very important to build up the governance around this technology. I would also add that this governance question applies to any kind of social science knowledge we create. So think about, for example, nudge. So this nudge style research where you like subtly change the environment and manipulate people to brush their teeth every day or whatever. Like to me, causal inference questions raise these same things. Like you have the ability to control pe what people do. Prediction is actually in my, in my sense, like much more limited. It's like, what is gonna happen to this person if there is no intervention in the system? So I think, yes, it can be misused, but I think that also applies to causal inference work as well. Uh, and I think the last question, uh, sorry. do the predictability issues exist in all situations for any researcher who is trying to predict high stakes social outcomes? Is there something wrong if we have a 80% accuracy or so? Yeah, so I think these issues occur in lots of situations. Uh, we don't necessarily know which situations they are more or less prevalent in. We lack these general theories. So for example, you might guess the further into the future you go, the harder the prediction will be, for example. That would be an example of a kind of thing that we would like to know systematically uh, and don't currently um, or haven't measured clearly. Um, and then does low predictability mean you have a problem? This is a question we had at the beginning as well. And I think, no, it does not mean you have a problem, but it might mean you have a problem. So unless you have a reason to explain that unpredictability. So I would say, if you think you have measured everything that's important and you still have a lot of unpredictability, that suggests that there might be something that you don't really understand uh, and you need to measure. <laughs> but if you, let's take the case of predicting financial stock market, right? So I can't predict the price of stocks a year from now. That doesn't mean I don't understand things about financial markets. That's just the property of the way financial markets are. And we have theories about why that is. So I think if you have a theory like the efficient market hypothesis for why something will be unpredictable, then I think high levels of unpredictability is not troubling. If all of your theories are about why things should be predictable, how important all these different mechanisms are, and then things are very unpredictable, then I think that is a time to reflect a little bit more on what else might be going on. Uh, we had some questions here. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you for today's talk. Um, just a quick question. What were the three cities in the sample? And then maybe a second question. Um, in your research, was there, for example, if you're interviewing a five-year-old, was there a value added in the data for how well that five-year-old could articulate their pain points? Um, was the interview or sort of making observations about whether their hair was combed, those sort of attributes that we all look for? Yes, yeah, so two, two, so first, what were the cities? Uh, we, we can't say, or I won't say. Um, so one of the things about this is these are real people and we take protecting their privacy very seriously. And if you look at the re-identification research literature, 
it suggests that if you can narrow it down to a city, it becomes much easier to re-identify who they are. So we won't say. Um, second is about what, um, what other things are being collected. So when they interviewed the kids, so when the kids were uh, nine, uh, and I think five, I can't remember if they did an interview with the kid at five, uh, they did, the interviewer did record um, how cooperative the person was, but in a kind of survey match. So like on a scale of one to five, how cooperative was this person? So they didn't take like detailed, rich ethnographic notes, but they did take score those things. They also, when they did the home visits, they did take systematic measurements of the physical environment. So were the kids clothes dirty? Were there exposed electrical outlets? things like that. They also did some systematic observation in the outside of the house. So was the sidewalk cracked? Was there graffiti? Things like that. It was a very, very impressive, careful measurement effort. Yeah. Uh, I have another follow-up question about what you said about the unpredictability of like stock markets. And so, so is the basic assumption in population study that most mass population data is predictable unless you have a theory stating otherwise? Yeah, this is a good question. So um, I would say we don't really explicitly say whether we expect some outcome to be predictable or not. Uh, but I would say in general, most social science is about why, not most, but a lot of social science is about why some group of people is going to be different than some other group of people for some outcome. And none of it is, not nearly as much, is about why people with the same characteristics will have different outcomes. Like very little, it's a lot about between group variability and not a lot about within group variability. And so I think if we don't have an argument for where that within group variability comes from, we're missing like a large part of the patterns in any data set. So I would love to get to a point where we would say like, okay, this is a high unpredictability domain. And so we know we're not going to be able to predict it well. And this is a low unpredictability domain and we should be able to do, to do better. But I don't think we have that insight yet. Hi, um, I have a question about the, I guess, the use of the metrics for predictability. I think in your talk, you mentioned um, pretty much the bias, variance, trade-offs for ML models and how, again, you can't really reduce MSC because of that trade-off, right, for ML models. And then towards the end of the talk, you mentioned uh, forecasting and you could switch to maybe measuring calibration instead. And so talking about the calibration score, for example, or Briga score, have you like, I mean, thought about why, let's say you would choose calibration versus like MSC minimization and what the trade-offs are in that case? Absolutely. So there's a big, um, there are many, many different ways to measure predictability. There are many. So why did we pick MSC? So we picked MSC for the Fragile Families Challenge uh, because one is we wanted an error metric that people were familiar with because it was a mass collaboration. And so we wanted to have something that was easy for people to understand. The second is mean squared error works well for both um, continuous and binary outcomes. And so some of the outcomes that we had there were binary, like uh, eviction. And so there we can measure calibration. Um, for continuous outcomes, calibration is a much more complicated concept. Um, and so we focused on mean squared error as our measure of accuracy for those reasons. I think one thing I'm very interested in going forward is other measures of accuracy that measure different kinds of things. So for example, mean squared error assesses your ability to exactly predict the outcome. But you might say like, really, all we care about is ranking the people. So like, we don't really care if we know whether you're going to be evicted or not. We just want to find the people who are most at risk of eviction. And so that... There are other predictability metrics focus on rank. Those would be an interesting alternative set of things to explore. It depends a lot on the, the context of the question. Thanks. Yep. Uh, thanks, mine, mine is kind of related to that actually. I, I was wondering about the metrics and um, so in, in the metric that you chose, you're dividing by this 
how well does the mean model do? Um, how well does the mean model do in general? Do you, for something say like GPA uh, prediction or eviction and, and follow up to related to that is that I was wondering if it might help for maybe purposes of communication with a kind of machine learning audience. Like people are often very comfortable with interpreting like area under the ROC curve for binary classification where we have some sense of like, it's pretty easy to get a 0.7 it's like harder to get a 0.85 or 0.9. And I was wondering for the binary ones, if you can like calibrate with respect to that, how, what does it look like in terms of area under the curve? Yep. So two questions. So one is what does the, um, how well does the mean of the training data do? And the answer is it depends on which outcome you have. So for some of the binary outcomes like eviction, they're uh, relatively rare in the data set, which is good. And so in that case, the mean of the training data does pretty well. Um, so it varies by outcome. But there, this relates to a kind of more fundamental question about whether we care, even care about absolute predictability or relative predictability. So for example, I could say, I can predict the weather in Los Angeles tomorrow. It's going to be sunny, right? Like, so even something that has high absolute predictability, I would say is not really a strong test of what we're actually doing. That's why I think it's very important to use these relative measures relative to some other baseline. Um, the second question was about the AUC. So we did not calculate that because again, we people in the challenge were focused on the mean squared error. And so we wanted to have a measure that was a direct transformation of the mean squared error. Uh, but you certainly could calculate those, and we could certainly do that. In the paper, we have uh, other plots that show for like a separation plot that shows there's lots of ways of trying to visualize the results. Um, but yeah, it, I think more metrics and making the metrics more interpretable is is absolutely an important direction for understanding predictability. Yeah. Oh, we have one more question in the chat. Um, for students from social science backgrounds with very little data science slash quantitative knowledge and skills, do you have any recommendations to getting for getting started in these trans in this transdisciplinary research? Well, I, of course, I would recommend reading bit by bit social research in the digital age. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I would recommend that, um, and you can check it out. The whole book is online for free at bitbybitbook.com. Uh, another thing I would recommend is there's something called the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science, which is a free summer training program for social scientists and data scientists who want to explore this new field. So I'd recommend checking that out as well. And finally, if this person happens to be at Columbia, I would recommend signing up for the Data Science Institute email list. I heard they have a great community, lots of exciting things happening. Uh, really cool. Uh, I'm sorry about this question in advance because I, I don't really understand exactly the question I'm trying to ask, but it's something along the lines of oftentimes um, it seems like in systems, so not just individual like human systems, but like at the atomic level or like neural level or cosmic level, um, there's individual level unpredictability. So that could be at like the atomic level, whereas in the system, you can use things like statistical, mecha statistical mechanics or other processes um, to actually predict pretty well how the system is, but the individual, either because of pure unpredictability or intractability, you, you cannot. Do you have any sense of like when you think at any system, individual level unpredictability is related to system level unpredictability? That's like a super weird. No, no, it's I don't not have super any weird. Oh, it's a great question. It's one I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so this, the the one other place that this comes up a lot that social scientists might be more familiar with is in epidemiology. And so we can predict like smokers will have higher rates of cancer than non-smokers, but that doesn't mean we can predict for any particular person whether they will get cancer or not. And so this kind of like impredictability at one level leading to predictability at another level turns out to be more common than just epidemiology. We heard a bunch of different examples. Um, I think a key part of whether this will happen is whether the collective outcome is a bunch of individual outcomes that are kind of averaged together, or whether those individual outcomes themselves are 
impacting each other and are correlated, in which case the collective outcome will also be very hard to predict. So in addition to predicting what's gonna to happen to individual people, there's a whole nother broad set of work about predicting collective outcomes like, is there going to be a civil war in which countries are most likely to go have a civil war or something? And the civil war is a good example because it's not easily reducible to any one person, right? A civil war is a collective property. And then there are also people that try to predict these, what I would call rates. So like uh, birth rate is something that we do predict out into the future. We don't try to predict who exactly will have a baby, but we can predict the birth rate because it's the average of many people's decisions. So I think a lot of it depends on the mechanism of aggregation and whether it's independent aggregation or interdependent. So to go back to one of the first questions I asked about, like, you know, what, how does this play out? Like, let's say in social science, uh, in traditional journal outlets that, you know, reviewers are going to, you know, if something is, and maybe the predictability language here is not quite appropriate, but let's say an estimate is, you know, a better estimate um, uh, or a strong estimate of what they're trying to, um, to study is more likely to get published, even if, um, a lack of, you know, estimate or, um, you know, evidence for a hypothesis is actually true to what they're able to do with the data they have and the data they have is good and there's reason to believe that they know what they're talking about. Is a potential unintended consequence of this kind of really interesting, important work that highlights predictability and or unpredictability that the uh, more unpredictable domains or types of research get even more marginalized than they already are? Um, that's a great question. I would, in fact, argue maybe the opposite, that part of what this does, so... We need you to edit, sure. <laughs> I know you're not busy. Yeah, so um, imagine if you do research in the family uh, about life course, and you have a regression model that you estimate one of the betas and you put the R squared measure in your paper and people are like, hey, your R squared is really small. Like, does that mean your model is not working well? I think what this can show is actually, this is about the ceiling that is possible. This model is actually pretty close to what is possible to do in this domain with this kind of data set. Um, so I hope we can move to a world where measuring unpredictability is important, no matter whether it's high or low. And so one of the, um, one of the things about this graph, actually, some data scientists have said to me, like, Matt, I'm really sorry the Fragile Families Challenge didn't work. And I say, what do you mean it didn't work? And they're like, well, look at the R squares are so low. And I'm like, no, it, that's, it, it worked. That's what we learned, like, this is what we learned, right? So working doesn't mean getting the highest possible R squared. Working means getting the right R squared. Um, and I think this design produced credible estimates. I think if we use different data sets or with trying to predict different outcomes, we would get different answers. And I think that's great. And we should get those different answers. And they're, whether they're high or low is, it's not really our choice. It's the world uh, and it's our techniques. And so it is what it is. Uh, and hopefully we can get to a point where we are accepting of what these things are and have realistic expectations because I don't think we want unrealistic expectations for, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> yeah. So for, um, for questions for all these uh, to, to find the predictability, I wondered if um, there was any discussion about the intersectionality. So for example, you know, individuals race, gender, would they play a role in their layoffs or job trainings or grids or anything? And then how it plays a role on predictability? This is a great question. So um, intersectionality is one of the things where I thought the machine learning would actually really help. So normally when we build linear regression models in the social sciences, we include, let's say race, and then we include gender, and we don't often include the interaction term. And it doesn't just have to be an interaction between race and gender. You can imagine there's interactions between 
almost everything and almost everything else, right? And so one of the things that uh, some of these machine learning techniques supposedly are really good at is uh, finding these interactions that you don't have to specify ahead of time. And so I was very hopeful that like actually finding these interactions would lead to improved predictability. Like what I, I did not think this is what was gonna happen. I thought what was gonna happen is these machine learning things were gonna find all these predictions and not, uh, interactions and non-linearities and it was gonna be much, much more predictive. It didn't happen. Um, I think we're still trying to understand why, but I think this approach is definitely uh, embraces the idea that there may be intersectionality um, one challenge with it is we don't often specify what we think the intersectionality is. We try to leave it to the data to tell us. It turns out that if you have um, the many predictors and not many cases, this becomes basically impossible. Because if there are 13,000 predictors, then there's 13,000 choose two possible interactions, which is like 85 million. And then we have 85 million possible interaction terms and we have like only 4,000 families. So forget it, right? So I think there's gonna have to be, and this is I think a, a, an open area for research is more ways of trying to combine um, this kind of inductive approach with the data with more theory driven approaches. So like we may say, not all 85 million of these interactions are probably that important. And, but we know based on our domain expertise, like these hundred might be important. And so let's focus on those hundred or even these thousand. Going from 85 million to a thousand is actually a really big improvement. Um, and so how can we take domain expertise from people that study families and social work and add that into the machine learning models? I think that's a big, exciting area. I think that was, uh, sorry, it might have to be the last question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.